Hello, everyone. Um, good morning and good afternoon, and uh, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Uh, I'm Sri Rao, your moderator for today's webinar uh, on selection of geomaterial properties for infrastructure features to reduce risk and enhance value. Uh, just uh, what I'm going to do is just give you a little bit of a background uh, on what, for those of you who are new to Webinar Wednesday, uh, we'll start with some housekeeping items, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, following that, our speaker will uh, present the webinar material, and uh, at the end of the uh, presentation, uh, I will also talk about uh, upcoming webinars, uh, and then we'll go to Q&A, and then I will also uh, uh, let you know how to get professional development hours. Um, so just a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you look on the screen, uh, there is a button for chat. Uh, if you have any issues with the webinar, uh, please uh, uh, send a message in the chat box, and the host will try to help you uh, through the chat box. And the screen that you see on is actually uh, the full screen mode, but even in the partial screen mode, you'll see these buttons on the top right-hand corner. Um, if you have any questions and answers, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, uh, please click on the Q&A button, and uh, what we will do is we will address those questions at the end of the uh, webinar. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so let me introduce our, now I'd like to introduce our presenter, uh, Mr. Jerry DiMaggio. Uh, Jerry got his bachelor's and master's from Clarkson University in New York, uh, and is arguably the most famous DiMaggio to come out of uh, New York, uh, uh, or at least the second most famous uh, DiMaggio to come out of New York. Um, he is licensed as a professional engineer in several different states. Uh, and he has a long work experience, um, as is listed here on the slide. Um, he is currently a senior principal engineer and associate at ARA. Uh, he's been with ARA for over five years now. Uh, before that, he had a career with the National Academies, where he was the implementation coordinator uh, for the SHOP2 program. And before he was the implementation coordinator for the SHOP2 program, he was uh, a full um, he retired out of the Federal Highway Administration uh, as the principal bridge en engineer uh, and was the National Geotechnical Engineering Program Manager at the Federal Highway Administration. So uh, as you can see, he has a very long uh, historical career with Federal Highway, with the National Academies, and now with ARA. Uh, he's recognized for his contribution to design, construction, uh, forensic analysis, dispute resolution, and a wide variety of topics uh, uh, related to geotechnical engineering and risk management. Uh, he has consulted over a thousand projects uh, in all 50 states throughout the Americas, Middle East, Australia, and has worked on many different bridge, which detailing structures, earthwork projects, and many, um, any kind of uh, geotechnical uh, projects uh, you can think of. Jerry has worked on those items. Um, so Jerry is really a well experienced. Uh, engineer with ARA and in the geotechnical engineering area. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Jerry to go ahead and start the program. Okay. Thank you, Shree. Um Good afternoon. Good morning to everybody. I hope you're well and safe in this moment of uh, temporary crisis, we all hope. Um, uh, the webinar is 60 minutes, and I'll speak to you uh, for about 40 minutes. As uh, Shri mentioned, we encourage you to send questions. We'll defer those until uh, I'm through the technical program and then uh, return it to, to Shri to moderate that session. So uh, to begin with, and you'll see this slide at the conclusion, and then uh, if you haven't noticed, the slide numbers are in the lower right-hand corner of the PowerPoint deck. And uh, selection of geomaterials and properties, uh, geomaterial properties for soil and rock, that might seem to many of you to be a pretty mundane topic, and in fact it is, I, I know, through my 48 years of practice. That's one of the reasons why most structural engineers became structural engineers. They took their first undergraduate degree, uh, got their first undergraduate course in soil mechanics, found out it was real boring, and decided they didn't want to become geotechnical specialists. So what I want to do in uh, this slide, and it sets out the three key messages, is why this topic? 
And as I just mentioned, I've been in practice for, for quite a while. I've had a blessed career. And what I've learned um, is that occasionally as we advance in the innovations that we see are truly remarkable really every year, every decade, the fact is it's, it's worthwhile to take a reflection back because we may have missed something. We may want to look at something that we take for granted. And I believe wholeheartedly this topic of geotechnical characterization of properties is, is very important. I'm not by myself, and I'd just like to give credit to some of my colleagues and good friends at both Ashto and Federal Highways who in the last couple of years have seen this same uh, opportunity and have gone back and produced and are producing a number of training programs and excellent manuals that kind of complement this brief program that I'll be presenting today. And, and the essence of it is there's lots of opportunities in the area of geotechnical exploration and characterization to reduce risk and enhance the value of projects. I'll touch on that as I go along. Now, you might ask, and I have to use my cursor with the format that we have here to highlight things for you, isn't everybody doing this already? And um, I'm giving you my opinion, and you could feel free to disagree with me, and certainly some of, the, some of us that are in practice are closer to the state of the art than the state of the practice. And the truth is, on average, however, that the opportunities that are presented to us relative to the state of the art are really tremendously greater than what is the average situation in the state of practice. And I, as Shri introduced me, you can tell those of you who don't know me, I touch a lot of projects, and uh, both currently and in the past. So there's a lot of opportunity to do better. And that leads me to the third key message, which you'll see my uh, presentation content kind of sprinkles all these key message components and bits and pieces of them, is I'm going to suggest some best practices, not only on new things, but things that we've taken for granted, as I mentioned just a couple of moments ago, on how we could do a better job with this, again, fundamental concept. Uh, for really all types of infrastructure projects in, in our relative practice. And the dominance of uh, my practice in the highways and, and rail, surface transportation, but it really is applicable really to all types of infrastructure facilities. Now, I, I commonly use the term geotechnical features. Some people have indicated that I, I coined the term. I'm not sure I coined the term at all. But what I want to do with this slide is to give you an appreciation. And the people that join our webinars are very fortunate. We've been doing this for over a year now. We have a very diverse audience. So some of the content I'm speaking directly to the geotechnical specialists, the engineering geologists, geologists, and of course geotechnical engineers. But I suspect that many of you are not in that category. And my objective here is to make you an informed consumer because you procure geotechnical services in, as a subcontract or a consultant or as an owner in a variety of things. And the impact of geotechnical features is often kind of overlooked, not that people think it's unimportant, by the fact that a lot of the work that we do is underground. We take things for granted. And I'll, I'll highlight one of these in particular. Earth retaining structures, a cliche you often use, is very similar to what Rodney Dangerfield his famous line, of course, many of you remember, was he didn't get any respect. And I suggest to you that in many cases, earth retaining structures don't get the due respect that they deserve. However, you should recognize that on average, roughly within the United States, every single year for both permanent and temporary applications, we construct over or approximately 200 million square feet of earth retaining structures. If we could refine our designs and our construction monitoring practices just a little bit for that one category of features, we'd be in tremendous, uh, much better place to do things and have a lot more confidence in what we do. Now, I'm going to speak uh, really principally from the highway community based on the abundance of my practice in that particular area of infrastructure, but everything I'm saying to you today is equally applicable to all kinds of infrastructure facilities. And if you just stop and think for a moment, the only thing that doesn't have a foundation of any type is a boat that we refer to as infrastructure. So we've got a lot of opportunity to apply what I think is uh, suggested in these 
next couple of slides that I'll share with you until about a quarter to one Eastern time. So everybody knows the basic equation of engineering across the board. You see here just borrowed photographs on the left. You see a failure. We don't want that in our designs. We do our best as we can to avoid that. And then you see on the right, over conservative designs and cumulatively, cumulatively as a, a group, we do this unconsciously, the bulk of our designs are over conservative. What I'm suggesting to you is that if you do a good job in site characterization, that's a commonly used term today and is quite appropriate, that you can refine your design so you don't have failure and you kind of reduce the conservatism in your designs. However, as you reduce the conservatism, you will not be compromising the safety, nor will you be exposing yourself to excessive risk. So what are some of the benefits? And I've got some of these slides have a bit of words on them. I'm counting on your ability to read them as I kind of paraphrase them a bit. Benefits of site characterization uh, at a high level is to give us an accurate characterization of what the underground environment is, and there's some details associated with that. To provide us reliable estimates of what the geotechnical design parameters are. Now, we talk a lot about in this webinar design, but the connotation that's implied, and in some slides is direct, is the fact that what we do in design is of equal value, and in some cases more value to the construct to the constructor, excuse me, to the constructors who have to build what we design. Unfortunately, another key benefit, which in many cases of the country is a tremendous reason why you should be doing a good site characterization, is the early identification of geotechnical hazards. Karst topography, soluble limestone covers about uh, a third of the country in the underground environment. If they're not, if that type of underground environment is not identified early, it can produce all kinds of problems in terms of change orders, at a cost, delays. Uh, seismic is generated in the underground, and uh, we know, maybe you don't know, depending on where you live, approximately 40% of the continental United States are obligated, at least in terms of highway features, to design their features for seismic extreme event loading. Now, I mentioned risk a couple of times already, so um, maybe it's worthwhile to just say a moment, uh, have a slide or two about site characterization and association with risk. And if we look at this, uh, what we're, what we're trying to do if we uh, perform an adequate job of site characterization is we want to reduce the likelihood of encountering a different differing site condition claim. We want to increase the reliability of our soil and our properties. We want to decrease uncertainties and surprises that will occur during construction. And a key point that I haven't mentioned thus far that's extremely important and goes hand in hand with looking at the properties of solid rock is increasing the confidence in our understanding and the variability of the groundwater environment beneath the surface. And groundwater environment is uh, an order of magnitude more complex than the solid rock profiles that we obtain through exploration, so we'll talk a little bit about here. So carrying on the risk definition, not everybody is familiar with risk. I've had the fortune of working on a number of risk management projects in the last couple of years. What is risk? Uh, and again, I'm counting for these word slides. You folks read along with me. We will have a PDF file that you can download of this presentation. That will be addressed at the conclusion of the presentation. Risk is a futuristic event. So we, we don't know if it's going to occur. Uh, we may have had some previous experience with risk on other projects and programs or at an enterprise or organizational level. A lot of people think by the name risk, it naturally connotates a negative situation, but actually some risks are really opportunities to enhance the situation that we're in. Now, risks, whether they're negative or positive, 
have an impact on project cost or program cost. They can affect schedule. They can affect maintenance of traffic and a topic that I'll speak a little bit about in a few slides and you can tell already that I'm jumping to a lot of different subtopics here is performance and by performance I mean post construction and for a long time in the future. The quantification of the risk is, um, is really made up of the likelihood of that uh, the risk event will occur times the impact and that's known as, uh, that product is known as expected value. Now, bringing it back to subsurface characterization issues, unfortunately, there are many risks on projects and programs that are directly applicable to subsurface conditions, no matter how broad we define that. On many of our projects, they present the greatest risk in terms of the numbers of risk, and I'm predominantly speaking about threats when I say risk, in that connotation, and also have the greatest impact. So we have quantity plus the expected value is quite large related to geotechnical matters. So just a quick example here, if you read across with me how we would develop what's known as a geotechnical risk management or risk register, we see a risk description beginning with the header on the left. We see a estimated or a quantified probability of occurrence. We see the impact of that particular risk. Who's the owner of that risk? Do we have a threshold value that triggers us as we go from a green to a yellow light so it alerts us to, to do something? And then once we've identified the risk, we usually have an action plan, which is we've got one or more, usually more, mitigation strategies that have to be executed to reduce either the probability of the occurrence or the impact or both. Now, I mentioned performance briefly, and we see performance occurring again here. Uh, a topic that's been around really for a while and there's more and more people jumping on the bandwagon and having a focused interest, not only geotechnical specialists, but owners both in the private and the public sector, and that is geotechnical asset management and asset management globally. That's the Cooper River Bridge, the Ravenel Bridge, often known as in Charleston, that you see illustrated here. And the point I want to make uh, relative to longevity is we often speak of design life and service life in uh, civil engineering or all types of engineering, but certainly in civil engineering I could speak with confidence in. We, we use these terms of 50-year design life and a 75-year design life. And in fact, latest thinking in terms of new tunnels which are building, we have many more tunnels in the United States than anybody would ever imagine, is that a design life of 150 years. That all sounds wonderful, but it's only been recently that people have began to ask, what in the world does that mean? Now, we're most fortunate because just recently, AASHTO has issued what they refer to as guide specifications. This guide specification uh, addresses service life, but it also deals with the issue of uh, protection for different types of infrastructure features, including um, geotechnical features, for the consideration of the level of protection that's provided in design and construction for a facility that's necessary for 50 years would be much less than it would be for a, a feature that has to last 100 years. That's the guide specification from Ashto. Um, I'm aware of an advanced copy of it. I have to admit, I think it will be published within the next month or so. Now, the objectives of the site characterization, you all know this, either as consumers or executives of this work. And we'll have two slides in there. One is stratification, groundwater information, suitability, uh, and let me not address all of these, but talk about uh, kind of cherry pick as I refer to them as we go along in these slides, is that when we look at suitability, what does that mean? Well, we love solid rock as a building material because it's plentiful, it's relatively inexpensive, but something that we have to be sure of and we have to rely on a capable and a qualified geotechnical specialist for this is not all soil and rock is suitable for all applications. All soil and rock materials are suitable for some applications. And we need to kind of hone in on that because regretfully Poor performance, either during construction or in post-construction, often is related to 
the misuse, uh, misspecification, and misapplication in terms of placement and construction of the wrong material in the wrong application. Now, a bit more on objectives that's a, a little bit more obscure. Certainly the first one in the identification of locating and aligning and putting the footprint for our feature that we're designing is, is pretty obvious. I'm going to focus a bit more as we go forward on these design parameters and what we mean by reliability. What, what's the difference in terms of uh, state of art versus state of practice and what can we do better? Something that we still are remiss and not thinking of automatically is regardless of what we do in design, somebody has to build it. So when we undertake a subsurface exploration program, and we do a summarization and interpretation and of the data and provide recommendations, we must always be cognizant of the fact that we're doing that for constructability purposes as well as for design purposes. And after the fact, we also often go through a site characterization program to evaluate the condition of a feature that's in place for a long time. And I mentioned that briefly before in terms of design life, but everybody, think of an embankment, an engineered fill material. What's the design life of that? That's not an easy question to ask, and that's not a question you've probably been asked often in your life. and may not ever be asked that question. But the reality is it does need some preservation and maintenance activities to last for the length of time that we need it in most applications. So there's a, a value proposition I suggest to you, and often the lay people that are on the or non-specialist, non-geotechnical specialists might say, you folks always want more borings. What's enough? Well, it's a simple formula that's articulated in slide 15 that basically says, when we look at the improved site characterization program may in fact mean we need more explanation, uh, more explorations. I'll speak to that a little bit uh, later in the program. And we really do a quick and dirty benefit cost analysis that should be done of if I take three more explorations for argument's sake, what's the value added concept? And that should be communicated or able to be communicated to you as an owner or the procurer of those services. And if it's not, then you hired the wrong specialist. Now, you think it's easy to get borings. Well, there's a couple of challenges associated um, with site characterization and the actual execution of the ex field explorations and the office studies. Here I'm highlighting the issues in terms of ex execution of the uh, field studies. Um, subsurface conditions are tremendously heterogeneous. Remember, this is not a man-made material. It's a God-made material. No matter how many borings you take, how many tests you take, the volume of the material that's going to be affected by the infrastructure facility that you build is enormously by several orders of magnitudes greater than the number of explorations and tests and samples that we can achieve. I'll talk a little bit about the third bullet in a moment, is that the behavior of solvent rock materials is, a very, is very complex in terms of the number of factors that influence that. And honestly, it's not, we don't do a very good job as a specialty discipline of matching what we're trying to model and test it in that configuration of strength of materials concepts to end up with the right answer. Uh, sometimes we're a little bit at a disadvantage because site characterization typically occurs fairly early on, preliminary stages of design on most projects, and the reality of the matter is not everything is uh, kind of gelled yet, in particular with co projects that are delivered by alternative contracting methods. There is also some practical issues in terms of getting access and permitting and budgets that we have to be cognizant of, and it goes with the territory. Now, along the lines of how many, uh, I've kind of copied some material from the AASHTO uh, design specifications for structures, and you see the table reference here. This, this reference simply just gives guidance in terms of the minimum number the locations of explorations and the minimum depths. And I've, I've indicated a couple examples that come from the AASHTO table, one for walls and deep foundations. The operative purpose of uh, slide 17 is really what does the word minimum mean? So I'm going to chastise uh, maybe some of you, forgive me for that, but 
minimum doesn't mean that that's enough in all cases. In fact, there may be some cases where you can justify, based on engineering expertise and knowledge, that you can do less than a minimum, and a, but the predominance of cases, a minimum is not sufficient. That's why engineers are paid the big salaries that we are making. We have to think about the requirements that we're trying to achieve for the facility we're trying to construct. Now, for the lay people, again, if you go into textbooks or you go into AASHTO or FHWA guidance, we would often find some very nice compartmentalized categories of different types of soils. In a common category, there are coarse grain soils that have certain general properties. And I'm not belittling these definitions. There's a punchline at the end of this and fine grain soils. The reality of the matter is these simplistic definitions don't reflect local geology, don't reflect geomorphology. So we have a category of materials that don't nicely fit into the classifications that we commonly use in practice. So the reliance and the knowledge on geology and geomorphology is imperative. I'll give you a specific example. Those of you who are in the East Coast that operate and live in the Piedmont region. We have a lot of residual materials, and those materials are fairly strong in place, but their models in terms of engineering characteristics don't necessarily fit uh, kind of the equations that we find in our books or our manuals, be they written by uh, a university professor or the federal government or AASHTO or any guidance that I would give you. You have to look at conditions that reflect what you really have, and they may not fit these textbook solutions. And that's all about soil. And again, in practice, most few technical specialists, this is where our friends in geology shine, geotechnical engineers by and large don't know a whole lot or as much as they should about rock material. And rock, truth be known, is much more interesting engineering material than soil is. In fact, if I, if I focus on this bullet here, and this, this intermediate materials, I should mention here, intermediate geomaterials is a catchy term that's caught on now for about the last 15 years or so. That, that residual materials in the Piedmont would fall in that category, by example. But I want to focus on hard rock here for a moment. And hard rock simply just means that hard rock is defined as an unconfined compressor strength above 1,500 pounds per square inch. But the reality of the matter is the hardest rock in the United States has a strength that exceeds 60,000 pounds per square inch. And if you think for a moment, those that work with concrete often, you think that some of the rocks that we deal with are order or magnitude greater than the concrete we would use in many applications. Now, I've got a question for you, slide 20. Evaluation of soil shear strength, that's an often desired known property, and I've listed here <clears throat> not quite an inclusive, but almost an inclusive list of different laboratory and in-place field tests and situ tests of what we could run to get a value of soil shear strength. Which one gives you the right answer? Okay, I gave you a split second to think about that, and the answer is they all do, but it depends. So how can we have a list that exceeds a dozen or approaches a dozen different test methods that give us a strength property of a material, and they all give us a different number, and they're all correct sometimes. Well, that means that the engineer has to know the limitations of the test and the utility of the test methods. In practice, unfortunately, we often forget that. Now, if we really, what we're really after, whether we do laboratory or in situ testing, is we want to know the engineering properties of the materials, and you see common engineering properties that we're interested in here. And in fact, again, for the non-specialists, there are a category of tests that we refer to as performance tests where we have the utility by the test procedure to attempt the model exactly what the stress conditions will be in the field. Now, to complicate matters, both for soil and rock, and this says soil, but it also applies to rock, the selection of the right test and the selection of uh, the determination of the strength that's appropriate depends on the variables that you see here. So the rate of construction loading, what's the rate of the application 
of the stress that we introduce to the geomaterial. That has a tremendous impact on the engineering properties. If we look at the third bullet, I won't go through everything in the interest of time. You can kind of reach out to me, as Shri will speak about later on, uh, post the, the webinar, is that the expected levels of deformation. So the modulus of a, a geomaterial is not linear, as many of you know, I hope. So we have to look at the exact deformation levels that we're interested in relative to the application and evaluate the strength properties in the modulus in association with that level of deformation. We also have to look over a period of time. And over a period of time, the concept that we're interested in is what happens to the geomaterial as a function of time? And what happens to the material that is embedded into the material as a function of time? So let's talk about each of these real quickly here. Is that from, a, from the geomaterial itself, the main things that affect its engineering properties are groundwater and changes in moisture content. There will also be some weathering effects, as you can see in the latter portion of the slide. The, the reason why I, I mention it in two contexts here, not only changes relative to a function of time to the in situ material, the geomaterial, but also the specific example, if I place steel and I place steel relative to drill shafts or micropiles or driven piles in the ground, and I feature that as supporting has to last 75 years, I have to be thinking, or I should be thinking, what will happen to the existing and the chain, temporal change in the corrosion and deterioration environment that might affect that steel over time. That's a topic in itself. That could be a webinar by itself. Getting the information. So two extreme situations. The one on the right showing you um, a swamp buggy rig, as we sometimes refer to it. And the one on the, on the left is a rig on a mountain that had to be placed, get information that we needed, uh, that had to be hel helicoptered in. The point of the slide is really we can get, for every application and infrastructure feature that we construct, we have the equipment and the tools to get factual information where we need it. Now the cost and the complexity and the challenges of achieving that might be uh, overwhelming from a budgeting point of view, but the technology exists, and that's the purpose of the slide. Now, testing of geomaterials, in particular soils, not rock. Our old buddy, who's been around 48 years of practice, I've been in practice for 48 years, and the number one tool for site investigation in terms of getting some index properties back then when I got out of graduate school, was a standard penetration test. There's an ASTM and a national standard for this test. It's as popular today as it was 48 years ago. And they do have ASTM standards in ASHTO that tell you how to get the proper equipment and conduct the test for people that are not familiar with it. It's not a very sophisticated test. I take a 140 pound hammer, I drop it by a variety of means, 30 inches, that's a potential energy, and then I drive a thick wall pipe into the ground and I can retrieve that pipe. I drive that pipe 18 inches and I get a value that's called the fuel end value that you see in the lower left here. And from that I can tell whether it's gonna to rain tomorrow, uh, who's gonna to win the next World Series, but more importantly I can get, if I understand and have respect for the limitations of the test, I can get some good information. So for Cohesionless soils, coarse grain materials generally, I can get what's known as the drain friction angle. This is a very good test for that purpose. This test, however, in my view, stinks when you're using it in cohesive soils. So we give you a number, it gives you a strength value, but it's the wrong number, one standard deviation removed. So we have to have respect and knowledge in terms of the utility and the limitations for each of these tests that we use. I'm picking on my good friend the standard penetration test here because I have a long history with it. And you see a chart, and this one comes from Ashto as well as you can see the reference here. 
we do some modifications to the field end value. We modify it by uh, normalizing the energy of that 140-pound hammer dropping 30 inches and really look at kinetic energy as opposed to potential energy. And we get here in this relationship between the average end value and the value of a range of friction angles, what we would see for cohesionless materials. Now, you might ask a question, um, 25 degrees versus 30 degrees, which one is right? Should I take the average? Well, we need a geotechnical specialist who's familiar with the specific geology that we're driving the material, the sampler into to give us some help and to look closely at the footnotes and tables such as this to give us the guidance to answer that question. Now, if you're not a geotechnical specialist, you might have an innocent, naive, and correct question. You say 25 to 30 degrees, what's five degrees among friends? Well, in geotechnical engineering analysis, that's a tremendous difference. So I've made my point. And you see uh, that N60 value, there's a variety of different uh, mechanisms, mechanical engineering mechanisms by which we can drop that 140-pound weight 30 inches. And you see in this chart what we've learned because the kinetic energy of those different driving systems is quite different, we need to normalize the value to an N60 to come up with a, a value that looks more like the subsurface profile that you see on the right as compared to the totally irrational profile that you see on the left. Those two borings were undertaken five foot apart, same geology, with the only difference being the type of hammer used to drive the sampler. Well, we've got a lot of other tools we push in the ground here, right? Uh, you see the standard penetration on the test on the left and a number of other tools that are quite common in geotechnical exploration practice throughout the remainder of the slide. Now, one of the things I've found oftentimes that people don't understand is that each of these tools is an index test. Go back again. An index test does not explicitly replicate the stresses that are applied to the material we're trying to test to achieve engineering properties. Therefore, we must have correlations. And what often people forget, a correlation, for example, that's done with a comb penetrometer, which is an excellent tool that's done in Florida based on the geology of granular materials in Florida, for argument's sake, may not necessarily be appropriate in Sacramento, California. So how are these things correlated locally? They have to be correlated back in this particular case the fundamental soil mechanics. Well, here's a consolidation slide. We're interested in compressible materials. We're interested primarily in the magnitude of deformation, and we're interested in the time rate of deformation. Well, my, my only message here is that we have great capability with the tools that have been around really since the 1940s to very accurately provide predictions to our clients in terms of the magnitude of settlement. And the good news is in terms of time rate of settlement, uh, the reality of the matter is that we uh, will overestimate the time it takes for deformations to occur. Groundwater measurements, we see a variety of tools that are used here. Is the variety of tools that are used here are such that we can determine what groundwater conditions are underground. And what some people forget is that existing wells and open borings and observation wells and piezometers are all different in terms of their purpose and yielding information that may or may not be germane to the answer of the question that we're asking. So, just because you drill a hole and you measure a water elevation, that doesn't mean that that's the correct elevation for the problem that you're faced with. Rock, we do a pretty good job in terms of rock analysis. We evaluate the engineering of properties of rock indirectly by the index values that you see listed here, and we categorize rock by a rock mass rating system or a geologic strength index. But the key thing to remember is that rock from an engineering point of view is much more complex to deal with than any soil that you can imagine. Well, what's the variability of these materials in place? And uh, 
If you do a better job of estimating the geomaterial engineering properties, should you get credit by uh, being allowed to use an LRFD, that's a reliability-based design platform, or allowable stress. Let me, let me talk in terms of allowable stress. There's not everybody on the line on the webinars in the highway business. Is that if I do a, a super duper great job on characterizing the site, should I be allowed to use a lower factor of safety um, than I would if I kind of did the minimum or less than the minimum? And the answer is intuitively right, but some codes necessarily do not specifically allow you to do that. Uh, that was true of the load resistance factor design code of ASHTO, but it's moving in a direction where you can get credit, so to speak, to be allowed to use a higher resistance factor or a lower factor of safety. Now, variability is enormous. This is a variety of case studies that have been assembled by uh, FHWA, uh, following on the work of Dr. Michael Duncan, uh, Berkeley, and then Virginia Tech University. And if I just highlight, there's a, a number of case studies where information has been kind of pulled together. Undrained shear strength of a cohesive soil. And the coefficient of variation that was determined by analysis, basic statistics looking at the data that was achieved, we have a value of undrained shear strength from the summation of individual case studies that varies from 13% to 40%. So what's the right number to use in a design when we have such a large variation if we look at a range of case studies that was examined here. So we have to be very cognizant of looking at variability of the material when we look at a project. And we can handle variability in two different ways. From simple statistics, we look at coefficient of variation. If it's less than 25%, then I think we're in a, a pretty good category. If it's greater than 25% CLV for the data that we have, and that we'll be looking at, for example, the standard penetration test or a type of laboratory test that's looking at a single tool for a single property, then we, we're going to interpret the site such that we either take more tests or different tests that's addressed in the lower bullet, or we subdivide the site. So when we begin a project and we look at a footprint for the project, it may be true that we think of it as one site, but it might be three sites. And using basic statistics with the factual information that's collected in the subsurface exploration program allows us to two things. One is to determine how many sites and how to divide certain stations or certain areas for a particular site that have common characteristics. And secondly, of equal importance to tell us whether or not we have enough information. Now, how do you finally pick the right properties? Well, Ashley tells you that there's a couple of things that we, we need to do, and those are we can use the combination of in situ and geophysical methods. We've done tremendous advances in geophysical and remote sensing lately. We use equally laboratory testing. We rely on historical data. But the punchline in slide 35 is the analysis of that data is really directed towards a change in what has been historical practice. Historical practice in geotechnical design has been to gravitate to the lowest value of data that we have. The reality of the situation is you have to carefully assess variability, which you just spoke about. We should conduct the sensitivity analysis and explicitly look at mean values and one minus sigma, uh, mean minus one sigma, excuse me, and looking at deformation analysis, look at the maximum differential settlement, which in many cases is more important than the total deformation. And then for actual traditional strength analysis, we should be using average property values. The boring then, and I'm almost finished here, I've got about one or two more minutes to go, is the summation of the field data and the laboratory data is portrayed on an individual exploration lot. The format of those logs has now become more uniform in practice. You should be aware and, uh, of a couple of things. One is that we want to record as much information as we possibly could. And frankly, in general, we're not very good at recording all the important information on a lot of our forms. 
And then you should be cognizant that there really are two logs. There's one that's taken in the field during the exploration. And then finally, what's known as a final log that's uh, prepared after all of the laboratory and in situ testing is evaluated for that particular boring. What we want to do, ideally, is to draw a picture. And that picture is worth a thousand words. Now, there's an aversion to those of you who are not in geotechnical practice you, you probably are not familiar with of being able to draw a profile such as this. A profile such as this should, uh, which just shows the uh, distribution of data at an individual boring location is suitable to be presented in a, a contract document. If we began to actually connect the lines between those individual borings like FP2 and FP1, we're going to get in trouble if we include that in the contract document. And that fear or potential liability has caused the geotechnical community to move um, significantly away from showing pictures such as this. Now, a picture such as this and even tech connecting the lines by engineering judgment is imperative for design because if you have difficulty not connect, if you have difficulty connecting the lines, that implies you don't have enough data. You may need more explorations. So I would encourage everybody to develop profiles as the actual field work is being undertaken. And just developing a profile like this might seem very easy to a layperson, but it's actually quite complex and requires a lot of knowledge relative to the project and good experience and expertise. All of this stuff is documented in reports. Uh, I just want to make you aware that these reports are defined very explicitly in terms of their purposes and what they should contain and how they're to be communicated to people. We generally do a pretty good job of that. Uh, where we fall down a bit is in the area of geotechnical design reports, which usually contain recommendations uh, for construction as well as design, of course. Now, a question that comes up is how does alternative project delivery methods, how do they affect, if any, this topic of site characterization? And the reality of the matter is they, at the end product, they don't affect it at all. I would encourage the geotechnical specialists and the owners and the overall design and constructors to carefully read the agreements, contracts, and subcontracts relative to referencing information, use of information that's been done by others, and execution as you move from traditional design be built projects to the myriad of different contracting methods. And I've just listed a couple here that I've had personal experience with. So, M product and all the guidance that's out there, not only in today's 40-minute webinar, but going forward, looking at all the references, the same for everything. The soil doesn't know how we're designing it or how we're contracting for the work. So I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, just a reminder of what my key messages were. Hopefully I hit the bullseye with at least some of them with some of you. And with that, I'd like to turn the program back over to Shree. Jerry, can you hear me? I I can hear you. Sure. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, Jerry, thank you very much for a great webinar and some great information that you provided. Uh, I want to talk a, a little bit about the upcoming webinars. We have uh, three upcoming webinars that are scheduled. On April 22nd, Paul Wilkie and Preeta Anand will talk about tools and techniques for payment evaluation and design. Uh, on May 20th, Ahmad Al-Hassan will talk about probabilistic safety analysis and friction management. And in June, on June 24th, uh, Dan D'Angelo will talk about project bundling and uh, how project bundling saves uh, money and uh, resources. Uh, so. Uh, we're ready for the Q and A portion. Um, if we do not get to your question and answer uh, questions um, uh, within the time frame allotted here, uh, please shoot an email to Jerry. His email is jdimaggio at ara.com, 
and we will try to get back to you via email. Um, so, Jerry, the first question I had uh, is uh, from uh, Jane. How do you recommend dispelling the general opinion that uh, conducting an adequate subsurface exploration and characterization program eliminates all risk and uncertainty on projects? Well, that's a that's a very good question. I've heard that cliche used a number of times and I've been watching the news lately. Um, I think you've just, um, I think you've got to make it perfectly clear that regardless of the number of explorations that we take or regardless of the number of tests, our objective is not to eliminate uncertainty and risk because that's an impossibility. We want to minimize it. Uh, if, you, if you fail, honestly, in terms of being able to communicate that and receive respect for that and get a positive response, uh, and I've used this cliche, I, I don't know you, look, at, look in the mirror, ask yourself if you've done your best job in terms of marketing and communicating the message. Uh, thank you. That was a good answer. Oh, can, um, here's a question from Kurt. Um, can you briefly address what role this topic has in terms of asset management and long-term performance of the infrastructure features? Yeah, that that is also a, that is also a good question. So again, I I jumped around and perhaps had too much material in uh, in these slides. Uh, in terms of asset management and geotechnical features, it, uh, I, I think the topic that is drawing the most attention is the topic of retaining structures. Um, you know, the topic of retaining structures is that we generally assume, in particular for the family of mechanically stabilized earth walls, which is the most common fill type wall in the world, we've had, unfortunately, some post-construction failures for structures that have been in place for 37 years. That has drawn attention, uh, has drawn many people's attention to examine the fact that we, we need to consider asset management programs for these structures because when they do fail, um, not all of them, but mo many of them fail catastrophically. And when they do fail, even though their, uh, perception, their percentage of failures is quite small, so I don't want to scare everybody, but the implications in terms of safety could be quite severe. And certainly the implications in terms of cost for investigation and remediation are enormous. All right, so here's here's a question, Jerry, that I have come across myself, and it's interesting for me uh, in everything I do, and uh, on your opinion on this question. Why do you believe uh, geotechnical designers uh, place excessive bias and emphasis on uh, lower bound engineering property values for geomaterials? And I guess this, this could be generalized to a lot of different things, but I want your opinion. and. Uh, and this question kind of uh, ties in with what I have a question about as well. Okay, that, that's a good question, and and I um, part of what I say may appear to be cruel, but uh, and not to you, but I I think I mentioned the reason why structural engineers became structural engineers is soil mechanics is boring, and rock mechanics are boring topics. I think, frankly, the my negative comment to the community is that. Soil and rock mechanics uh, are not sexy enough to be taught in university, even in graduate programs anymore. And we have a number of engineers practicing who have PEs that, frankly, are not well versed in these fundamental disciplines, and, and that's a problem. The other real problem, even though you're quite sharp uh, in terms of uh, rock and soil mechanics and strength of materials, that's really how they were both born, is the fact that People are concerned with liability. People are concerned with liability, which is a legitimate uh, concern. So the thinking is, if I pick a conservative number, then I'm fine. So uh, actually, we got this question that may be a little bit related, uh, but um, we got this question early in the program. Uh, you mentioned uh, in the beginning about state of the art and state of the practice. Uh, what do you think? can be done to reduce the gap between state-of-the-art and state-of-the-practice in geotechnical engineering? 
I'm a, that's a good question. I, I, I think it's uh, more training in, in baby steps, and um, I don't think, in spite of the emphasis on it, to, to maintain our license respectively, regardless of what discipline we're in, I don't think um, professional engineers and engineering geologists have enough continuing education training. I think that would help. And I'm, I'm, I do a lot of that, so don't misinterpret me as I'm trying to sell my wares. Uh, I, I truly believe it's like the equivalent of going to a doctor that had 48 years of practice and then went to two continuing education school. That's not the guy you want to go to, God forbid, if you've got a heart problem. You want to go to somebody who's really staying out with things that change, and they change every year. So education and training. So uh, here's another question, and we have time for uh, maybe a couple more questions. Uh, you mentioned the enhanced value of improved property selection practices. What does that mean in terms of uh, what can be measured, measurable project and program benefits? Excuse me. Um, if we talk about a specific project, I think if you look at uh, if you look at applying basic statistics in terms of focusing on that, one of the last slides I have, mean values and look at sensitivity analysis to see what the implications are on the design decisions. Uh, probably the best example of that, and, and I love deep foundations, one of my favorite specialty topics. However, my general view is because we don't do a very good job on subsurface exploration and geomaterial properties, we excessively transition from shallow foundations to deep foundations, and without, without any consideration, deep foundations are going to be significantly more expensive. Now, in our cases, where deep foundations are mandatory because of the performance requirements for the project, but the reality of the situation is, in an awful lot of cases, we could do just a crackerjack great job with a shallow foundation. So uh, one last question, and, and this th this is kind of an interesting one, and, and slightly off topic, but maybe not. Uh, why do you place such strong reliance on FHWA and ASTO technical guidance related to this topic? Well, I'm I'm a little biased since I spent 32 years of my life in that arena. Um, I I think certainly, and, and I do work occasionally with the Corps of Engineers currently and in the past. That's not to cut anybody out, but uh, I think FHWA and ASHTO in the geotechnical uh, discipline area have been fortunate in that they had the vision as well as, more importantly, had the resources to keep topics current. The ASHTO Bridge Code, as an example, is one of the few codes that I'm familiar with which is updated annually. And that bridge code was originally written, I think, in 1935. So with the exception of one year, I don't know of any other code, and maybe it's my ignorance, that's updated every single year. So they're current. And they tend to, in general, final comment is, they, gen they generally tend to give guidance that's uh, appropriate to be applied from a practitioner's point of view. Well, that's a great answer, Jerry. Um, so. Uh, we're at the end of our uh, one-hour webinar Wednesday. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Jerry, for your presentation. I'd like to thank uh, all the pre uh, all the participants for participating in this webinar. Uh, if you are wanting uh, professional development hours uh, and to request a PDH certificate and or a copy of the presentation, uh, please send an email to arawebinars at ara.com. That's arawebinars, one word, at ARA.com. Uh, thank you again. Have a great afternoon uh, and stay safe. Bye.